green? Ah, uh, no, no, okay. <laughs> uh, welcome everybody, good morning. Thank you for uh, making it uh, to our session uh, this morning at a relatively early hour. Um, where we'll be talking about uh, journalism at impact, strange bedfellows with a question mark uh, behind that. And uh, we have a, a quite exciting uh, group of uh, panelists here um, on the table. So I, uh, my, my name is Eric Carstens. I'm a consultant and uh, grant writer. And I um, should warn you that uh, I work a lot for the European Journalism Center and for the Gates Foundation. So I might be a little biased here. Um, so take that into account. Um, concerning uh, our panelists, uh, we have uh, Stein de Brauere, uh, who is an analytic e analytics, analytics expert from uh, Belgium, uh, with international experience, of course. Uh, we have uh, Stefano Liberti, uh, an Italian journalist specializing in uh, multimedia investigations, if I may say so, but please correct me uh, when you're showing your work. We have in the middle uh, Wilfried Rütten, director of the European Journalism Center and uh, responsible for the grants program um, uh, Innovation in Development Journalism. Um, we have uh, Elisabetta Tola, uh, a science journalist uh, from Italy as well. We have the photographer Pierre Morel from France. Um, and uh, last but not least, we have Emanuele Bompan, uh, who is a specialist in uh, mapping and geography uh, for journalism. Uh, so to speak. So, um, All of them uh, will uh, give you a statement and show you their most recent projects uh, later on. But first, I wanted to um, set the scene. Why are we talking about impact so much? Uh, the question of impact has become very popular in journalistic projects over the last years. It seems like everybody is talking about that uh, issue. How do we measure impact? How do we achieve impact uh, with journalistic projects? And I think that has um, not least historical reasons, because uh, a while ago, um, journalism was uh, kind of self-contained in a way. It made money for publishers by uh, who uh, sold advertising, for instance, who sold subscriptions, who sold copies, which meant that uh, um, uh, the, the success of journalism was measured by that kind of uh, um, yeah, subscription uh, and advertising revenues. But now, in recent years, um, since there is a uh, financi financing crisis in journalism as well, like in many other areas, uh, third-party donors have entered the scene and have started to support journalistic efforts. And uh, of course, once a third party gets involved, this third party needs to justify their investment. And many of these third parties are foundations or other donors that have their own interests. And uh, of course, they want to demonstrate to their donors, to their um, uh, funders in turn, how they uh, made use of the money, what kind of impact they achieved, what kind of real world consequences the journalism that they supported um, did achieve. And a point in case is uh, the grants program run by the European Journalism Center Innovation and Development Reporting, which allows journalists to apply for money to do large scale investigative projects. And all the journalists uh, here on the table, uh, they have done projects under this program and uh, they will show you uh, them later. But um, the next question is, what is impact in journalism at all? And um, like uh, many other um, uh, ideas uh, in, in this respect, uh, the, the term impact comes from marketing, project management, operations research, and they in turn are based on military uh, planning, military ideas. So impact is when a bullet hits a target in military terms. And um, that's a quite straightforward thinking about impact. So you have a clear cause and effect. But if you look at journalism, this kind of cause and effect is not that straightforward. It's more complicated, you have to take detours to find out what um, journalistic impact can actually achieve. So um, essentially, we have four levels of measuring impact or finding out impact of a journalistic story. Uh, the first one is a qualitative evaluation. You can set some goals, some values before you start out, such as say, um, impartiality, 
balanced reporting, um, fairness in terms of uh, presentation of genders, um, good geographic coverage, and so on. And you can look at the results and see whether the results match these values and these ideas. So that's a, a kind of a manual, um, very complex assessment of journalistic products. The second level um, is um, the quantity. How many people have actually clicked on the page that uh, your story was on? How many uh, copies were sold of the newspaper where which ran your story? and so on and so forth. So that can be measured by technical means if you have access to these means. The third level is um, what is <laughs> called engagement. So engagement means what do the readers do actually when they uh, interact with your story? Do they just read it? Or do they read it to the end, if at all? Do they read only the first page of the screen? Um, do they skim over it? but also do uh, readers share your story? Do they recommend it to friends? Uh, do they tweet about it? Do they leave a, leave a comment uh, underneath it? So that would be engagement, and that's already a kind of a stronger indicator of the impact of your story, because um, you might assume that if people interact with your story, if they recommend it, they might like it particularly well, or might find it particularly useful. So. Both these, uh, the, the quantity and the engagement, can be measured by technical means. And then the final level, so to speak, is the impact. And impact in the current definition um, is real-world effect. So strictly speaking, you have an impact with your story if, for instance, um, a politician gets ousted from office because you have unveiled a scandal or wrongdoing or a new law is made, for instance, or something, something like this, some real world change. But that real world change is obviously very hard to track. There is no technical measurement for that. You really have to um, ask people what happened. You have to follow up on uh, any, any effects of your story, what ripple effects your story has uh, after it has been published. And uh, that is really the, 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 yeah, the gold standard of impact measurement to find out uh, this kind of real world changes affected by journalism. Then of course you can ask, is, journal is that a, a, a task for journalism, journalism at all? Um, and um, um, as I said, uh, the, the, the grants program that is run by the European Journalism Center asks the journalists also to achieve impact. It's a, uh, grants program that in turn is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, one of the big players in international development. And um, uh, this is why I will ask uh, Wilfried Rütten now to quickly introduce that program before we then hand over to the journalists uh, at the table. Wilfried. Thank you. Hello. Yeah, good morning. It's hard to introduce a program that has been running for a while. We have been granted an extension now for another year, so we will be doing it until the end of next year. So we're going to have another three rounds of applications coming up. The next one is in September 5th. So all of you who are interested in applying, keep it in mind, September 5th is the next deadline. Um, being a journalist myself, it, it became, it was a bit awkward when we first started discussing with the Gates Foundation because, the, this, as Eric said, the, the notion of impact is, is not native to journalism. You don't really think about it so much. There's an old Rolling Stones song, Who Reads Yesterday's Papers? And in the old days, you would publish a story, you would forget about it the day afterwards because there was a new news cycle, a new day. And uh, when I remember when I was working in news, I could dump everything on my desk at night because tomorrow will be a new day with new stories, with new excitement, and you didn't have to look into stories. How, how did stories get legs? How did stories develop? How did stories change things? Because there were new stories coming up. So you would always follow new, 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 and you would just serve the machine on one hand. On the other hand, what we also saw, uh, in, if, if you like, in a deterioration of things is uh, the attention economy became very important. People were not, would not be paying attention to the important things, but would be paying attention to Kim Kardashian or uh, all, all the celebrities or football players who did something. 
and that would be raising so much attention. And, and, and the, the most important and real important stories, they would maybe get lost, lost or left behind and nobody cared about it so much. So in comes the Gates Foundation with a lot of money and a lot of ambition and says, hey, we want to do this differently. How can you help us do this differently? And um, okay, we set up the grant scheme uh, in nine countries. We have a lot of very nice examples on the website. Um, and uh, you, you will see some of the examples here from, from, from the grantees in the room, obviously. Um, and we were hard put in the beginning to, 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 to really get this idea of how to measure, Im should we even measure impact? Uh, and we try, uh, I tried to talk them out of it several times, but uh, unsuccessfully. No, no, impact measurement is what, you, what we're going for. So yes, then we finally decided to, uh, first we looked at market situation, could we, could we find a solution uh, of off the shelf uh, embed codes on websites, embed codes on newspapers, which we found was quite unelegant also. A lot of our grantees are freelancers. They do not have real influence or cloud in the, in the newsroom management or in the content management system of the newspapers or with the IT guys in newspapers. So uh, then we, dis and we looked at some other solution and Stein is one of the guys who, who did actually have something uh, developed, but um, we looked at it for a while and now we decided to, to, to come up with our own impact measurement tool. And uh, my two IT guys sitting there, Ivan Arne in the room, uh, maybe raise your hand. Uh, these guys came up with a real solution now to, to measure impact. And um, I'm not going into, the, into technical detail there, but we have something very nicely uh, set up that we will be launching uh, for the next round. And also some of, some of the, the grantees here would still have to uh, fill in things there. We can track URLs, we can track uh, Facebook likes, Twitter feeds, uh, link backs to into several layers and, and things like that. So we hope to, to come up with a measure of impact. The funny thing is um, the EGC is a company with 17 or 16 or 20, depending on how you count them, staff. <laughs> and I talked to people with 17,000 staff, uh, the German Development Corporation uh, company, GIZ, they have the very same situation. They have to measure impact and they have no solution for it either. So why is it that a 15, 16 people company uh, comes up with a solution for, for, for people who have 16,000 people on staff? I found it quite ironic that we should be the ones uh, to come up with a, with, a, with a solution for that. But we, we do, we will. And um, I think the role of journalism is, is changing. We were just interested in the story and then we forget it. Now we will have to see stories that get lagged, stories that are not forgotten the day after they get published, stories that have an impact on, on several layers. And as Eric said, cause and effect is very hard to measure. Uh, today, Emanuele showed me a, a eight page spread in La Stampa on development, uh, a special supplement uh, the newspaper did today. Uh, is it because of us? Probably not. Would it have happened if we had not existed or if it had Emanuele not done these this great follow the money stories for, for La Stampa? We don't know, but the likelihood is it would not have happened. So measuring cause and effect is very difficult. And, and also journalists would like to believe this is a great story. I don't care what the impact is. <laughs> this is the first gut feeling we get. Also when, when we review applications, we, we look for stories. Is this story great or not? And, and not what is the potential impact. But it's, it, we realize it's not good enough. We have to, to look into real life effects and if you want to, especially on this development topic, if you really want to make an effect on, on, on issues of development that are vital, uh, we can't just say we wrote a story and then we close our eyes and write another story. So the, the impact issue is, is on, on the agenda and it, uh, since we, we have a solution now or working on it, you see a lot of people looking for the same, have the same issues and everybody would like to have some impact measurement tool or some, some impact knowledge or a feeling of what is the impact of the, of the stories we're doing. So maybe also journalism is changing more into be, to in being relevant, in being uh, held to account itself. We, we we're very good at holding politicians and public to account on all kinds of things. And then you see uh, being held to account ourselves is not what we, what we grew up with. We, we just scrutinize everybody else and not ourselves and our industry so much. And maybe this is the time now to also see what we are doing and where is, uh, where is the impact of our work and is our work worthwhile and how can we improve that impact 
uh, to, to change societies as most journalists would, would want to be changing societies, obviously. Um, so far for now, I'll leave it at that. I'll comment a bit more later on, uh, and I'll give it back to Eric. Uh, thank you, Wilfried. Um, Stefano, would you like to start with yeah. um, your project? Hi, thank you, Eric, and thank you for the exciting panel, as you said. <laughs> um, good morning. Um, I'm Stefano Liberti. I <coughs> I'm going to present this web documentary I made with my colleague Mathilde Villain and the team. We, thanks to uh, EGC funding last year, this web documentary, The Dark Side of the Italian Tomato, has been uh, realized last year and uh, released uh, multilingual in June 2014 in English uh, in the Al Jazeera English website, in French by the Radio France Internationale website, in Italian by Internationale magazine website, and then later on one month after, after in uh, Spanish by El País. The web documentary um, mm, follows the tomato supply chain between Italy and Africa, and uh, namely Ghana. Uh, all the investigation started in, the, in summer 2013 with me, with my colleague and me and I, we made uh, an investigative report in southern Italy. And we, we went to visit the tomato fields, and as it is widely known, uh, we met all these people who are working in the fields. They're all mostly African migrants, mostly undocumented African migrants that who work in very bad condition where for very low wages, live in a sort of shanty towns around the, the fields. Then we decided we, we tried to um, understand where these tomatoes went from the fields. And we discovered that some of these tomatoes were actually transformed into tomato paste and then exported worldwide, and also a part of them to Africa, and namely to those same country of origin of people who were working in tomato fields in Italy. That is when we decided to apply for the GC funding program. We got, a, we, got a, we got a grant from them, and we that allow us to continue our investigation to go to the field in Ghana and in Italy again to put together a team uh, that is composed by data journalist, a web designer, um, cameraman editor and so on. When, so we went to, we started to cross datas and because we saw that uh, we, could, we, we actually uh, analyzed data of uh, a tomato ex paste export from Italy uh, to, to Ghana. And we, we, we saw also the same data of tomato production in Ghana, because Ghana was a tomato produ producing country. And we found something that was really interesting. So there had been a surge in uh, tomato imports in Ghana and tomato export from Italy to Ghana at the beginning of the two, uh, of years 2000. And at the same time, there had been a decrease of tomato producing in Ghana. So we, we made uh, we had this idea that maybe there is a connection between these two, these two aspects. And we went to Ghana to discover whether there was a connection or not. We went to this toma tomato producing region in the north and actually they were not producing tomato anymore. Uh, people were had switched culture or uh, they actually had abandoned the camps. We met producers, we met uh, NGOs, we met politicians, and uh, actually we, all of them were complaining that we were not able anymore to produce uh, tomato because of the unfair competition from Italy and also from, from China. So the question was, uh, how come that uh, a, um, a product from Europe could compete with the local product. And there are two aspects that uh, allow this kind of competition. The first one is that Ghana government had uh, um, reduced import tariffs at the beginning of 2000, almost to zero. So products from outside could come without paying any import tariff. And at the same time, 
e Italy and European products from agriculture could benefit from uh, subsi subsidies uh, under the uh, agriculture um, common policy. That allow this kind of uh, dumping of products. When you go to a market uh, to Ghana, you can see the tomato paste from uh, Italy and from China are really cheap. Are really, pff, you can buy like um, tomato paste like that for like 40 euro cents. And uh, that prevented actually a um, local indus transformation industry to, from uh, developing. And there were there were some industries some in uh, in Ghana, but they 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 closed down. So we started to organize this web documentary that is composed by video, text, uh, and also a kind of animation here. And um, we wanted to actually show this vicious circle. The vicious circle actually has another, the, the last, the, the closure of the vicious circle, if you can say, if you can say that, is that some of those people were um, actually um, compelled to change uh, culture or to abandon their camp, decided to migrate, and some of them actually migrate to Europe. So our main character is a guy we met in Foggia, near in, in southern Italy, who was formerly a tomato producer, then was, was not able anymore to produce tomato because there was no market for him, so decided to go to Europe, and uh, he now if, he finds himself picking up tomatoes in southern Italy for the Italian industry, and those same tomatoes are actually being transformed into tomato paste and are going to his home country. <laughs> Uh, so uh, allowing this kind of visit circus to go, to, to go on. So that is basically our job. It was, uh, I'm, I don't know if we're going to talk about impact now or later on, but it's got a very good visibility at the, when it was released in uh, last year. And we got many reviews. We were invited, we are still invited to present uh, the project uh, all around. And um, I think there is a... Um, I mean, I, I thank uh, Wilfred at the European Journalist Center because they, gave, they give us a very good opportunity to make a kind of journalism which is, very, which is unique now because we are able, thanks to their funding, to work on a project for like four months to put together a team with very different um, skills. And uh, this kind of storytelling is very... Uh, challenging for us because we, Matilde and I, we are journalists, we are old style journalists, then we, we discuss with the other journalists, uh, Jacopo Taviani is very well known, to Wilfred is very well known in Italy as a data journalist, we talk, we talk with the web designer and there were, there were a lot of discussion in the, um, during the, um, the process, I say, and uh, finally we got a product that was really satisfying to us. And uh, and was a very good uh, professional development for to all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. <laughs> Elisabetta, would you like to go on? Yeah, can Switch you? places. <laughs> Thanks. Just a second. So, good morning everybody. My name is Elisabetta Tola. I'm a science journalist. I'm a radio presenter, but I also um, I work as a freelance um, with my own company, uh, Formica Blue, which is a science communication agency. And uh, in recent years, I've been working a lot on data and multimedia. So, the project um, I applied for to the uh, AGC grant scheme is called Sversity. Maybe we can have... Maybe we can. Hmm? There we are. And it's a web documentary again. I'm just going to show you the trailer and then tell you something about it. This is just the landing page, and you have a very brief description of uh, uh, the basic question that the project is trying to uh, answer or 
uh, to explore and we just go to the sorry trailer Sorry, we're not seeing it. I don't know. See, why? We tried before. <laughs> We tried before, and you can see it usually. I don't see why. Don't see it now. I don't understand why. Yeah. No, no, it doesn't show. I don't know why. Okay. Well, usually here there is a trailer, and <laughs> um, the the basic idea here was to try to answer to a question that in the recent years uh, we are. Uh, pulls into ourselves continually. We are going to be 9 billion people on the earth uh, within the next uh, 20 years, more or less. Uh, will we be able to feed everybody? And uh, why now we have already 1 billion people, more or less, who are undernourished. Uh, coming from science, I know that uh, the usual answer is we have to produce more, to do more um, technological development in uh, food production. But because I also... Uh, I come from agriculture. Yeah, we can close this. I probably it's easier. Yeah, sorry. Um, coming from uh, uh, an agricultural background, I also know that uh, the only answer is not only the uh, technological production or improvement. There are loads of uh, farmers groups and agronomists who think that uh, there are other ways to actually improve uh, the uh, availability of food to people. And one of these ways is actually to keep the seed production in the farmer's end. Because nowadays we have about 75% of the seed market in the hands of four or five big companies. And these data are actually quite uh, strong, I think, because we're talking about food security, and we're talking about the fact that the key of food security are in the hands of very few companies worldwide. So we decided to try and explore and go around uh, different countries, uh, West Africa, uh, East Africa, Middle East. The, the, the menu here was showing, maybe we can just see the map. Uh, Again, I'll just take off the, the audio so we don't have the music here. Okay. And uh, we went around uh, Senegal, Ethiopia, Iran, a few different Italian regions and France, thanks to the uh, EGC grant, to um, document experience in the field with farmers and agronomists going back to local varieties, like old varieties, and trying to select these varieties, like wheat, rice, millet, uh, trying to select the new varieties which are more productive, but in a way that these seeds are actually kept in the hands of farmers. So they're not uh, copyrighted and sold in the market with a high price. They're actually um, kept within seed banks uh, in uh, local places. So we started this long tour in different uh, places and come up with loads of video material and data and we decided to assemble it in a web documentary using a platform which is Clint, it's a French platform, um, and producing a web doc which was together video and data. We have a data section here where basically for each one of the uh, indicators we decided to explore, you have an interactive map. So we have a map of all the projects of participative breeding in the field. We have a map of the seed banks that have been built in the last few years in different countries. We have a map of the biodiversity center. So trying to put together data and the video stories. Uh, we wanted to basically show that there is a movement, still a niche we can say, but growing, of experiences, science-based experiences, which are showing another way to uh, getting to food security and food sovereignty, which is uh, working together with the farmers and really trying to give them the key of food security. This was very interesting because during the year, last year when we did the project, was the um, Family Farmers Year for FAO, for Food Agriculture Organization. So it was actually nice that we decided to publish on the 16th of October, which is the World Food Day, and we published the web, the web doc on uh, Wired magazine in Italy. 
Um, and the same day, the FAO published a report saying that, in fact, the data say now that 80% uh, of food production worldwide is made by small family farmers. So this sort of uh, strategy is definitely something that should be enforced, innovation for small family farming. Uh, the output of our story were basically the web doc, but also an audio doc series, which we um, broadcast in the National Public Radio last July. And in fact, in a way, I was commenting before with Eric, it was interesting that we had somehow much more feedback from the radio broadcasting, like the listener really sent a lot of feedback, much more than what we really managed to collect through the web doc uh, online. Um, but we had some medium and long term sort of impact in the fact that uh, once the project was out, we've been invited to actually give snippets of the video part to uh, a couple of exhibitions, like national exhibition on food. This year, of course, in Italy, it's, there is the expo on food. So there is a lot of attention on this kind of topic. So we've been at sorry, asked to actually provide some part of the documentary for an exhibition on food, which is displayed now at the uh, National Science Museum in uh, Milan, which is food from uh, science to the plate. And, um, and then we've been invited by a few regional administrations to discuss the possibility to actually do some sort of investigation like this at the local level, because there are many more now regional uh, administration trying to preserve local biodiversity through a system which is quite similar to what we say and tell in the, in the documentary. So again, and I, I think we will go back to that during the discussion today, uh, it's very difficult to measure, it was very difficult for us to measure an impact in terms of numbers. We have some numbers, of course, but at the same time, what we're seeing is that this kind of issue was still very little known. And while, when it went out, we had more researchers and administration were actually interested in knowing more about the things that we have been uh, uh, talking about and even asking us to be involved in group, in working group on this kind of uh, um, ability to tell the stories locally, like, let's say, there is, for example, Marche region. It's a region in Italy where it's done a regional law on biodiversity. The law is like eight years old, but they still haven't found a way to actually tell stories about this. So once they saw the documentary, they say, we would like to do something similar for our regional uh, biodiversity um, strategy. So I think that that's something. I, I, my idea now is to actually continue this project not to stop it here, but to make it a bit more uh, bigger for a couple of years and trying to really go to many more of those stories we put on the map uh, and try to uh, bring all those data together. Thank you. Actually, you can find it on seedversity.org because we did a website dedicated. Thank you. Bonjour. Hello. Everybody. So I'm Pierre. I'm a photojournalist. I represent uh, the people who worked with me on the project Rebuilding Haiti, Flora Mora and Jean Abetici, who are not here. And uh, so I will introduce you the project and I will go quickly on that and then show you what's the impact we got, what are the impact. So let's go to the presentation. So the project is called Rebuilding IT. It's, uh, we don't call it a web documentary, we would prefer to call it a long form journalism or scrolly telling because you have to scroll to visit it. It's a project that was uh, made uh, last year with the journalism grants. And um, it was um, showcased on the website, French website, rue 89, rue 89.com. It's a French pu pure player. So the project is about the, um, the reconstruction of the country of Haiti. It came out after the earthquake uh, challenges um, in 2010. And uh, the journalist, Jean Batici, um, uh, know very well this country and would like to, to go there again and to focus on some topic and to see what could have been done 
in terms of development in this country. So what we did, uh, basically, it's to make a platform. It's a multimedia fiction report on the development challenges uh, IT has to face to today. So I will, I will show you on the internet how it looks like. So basically, you, you, you have to scroll. And we divided in six chapters the project. Each chapter is um, related to one topic. So we start with the first one. It's about um, building and a slum. And so you have text, you have a photo, and a full screen picture. And then, so it's all facts and report. We've been there uh, two weeks. And uh, we add with the news game of manager Flora Morin a part of um, question and fiction. So our aim with the project was to to put the 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 viewer um, at your place and at the place of a mayor, at the place of uh, an NGO guy, and to see. So you have a problem like challenge one, how to put the growth of centitons to health, and what do you do? And you have different choice, and you choose one, so you have an answer, and you can choose another one, and you have another answer on the fish fictional part of if you do this choose choice, you, you have um, consequences. So, and you have an um, illustration related to that. And then you go through the chapter to the end. And the next, the last uh, chapter, the number six, it's a totally fictional chapter about um, consider the choice you made, uh, what will be IT in the next 15 years. So it's totally fictional. It's to, to make the people understand the choice you can, the choice you can do and uh, what are the impact on that choice. So that's basically the project. If you want to visit it, you can go. It's online still. So I go back to the presentation and more go to the, um, the kitchen of the project. So we were uh, six people, a news game designer, a journalist, photographer, myself, graphic designer, a developer, and a translator. Uh, the budget quickly and uh, all was funded by the journalism grants. We got uh, 22,000 euros and uh, this means uh, 3,000 euros to 4,000 uh, for the author, the production expensive and the translator. And I add also that the website, they provide us uh, 6,000 euros, but not in cash, but in uh, advice and hosting, um, um, technical hosting. So I said that because since the website doesn't put um, a, a neuro in the in the project, they don't need also to to promote the project and to make the project uh, live and so on. So that's that's something very important to say because if you want to to have an impact and measure the impact, it's only on you that the impact will be. I mean, uh, we are all freelancers, so the project, the communication of the project was made by the team and not by the website and uh, the newspaper. They went, it was just free for them, so that's something interesting for them. This is the timeline, so you can see it's very long project, and uh, that's also important because the impact you can have is um, you, you have to think about impact in long term. And uh, so, when we, when we before before to go to IT, we, we start to, to have a, a little impact by make, making a blog, a Tumblr, about uh, what we are going to do. And um, there is different aim of that. It's to show what how we work, and to make also connection and contact with partner NGO and start an engagement with the audience. So on the Tumblr, we did, we made. We put like a uh, backstage uh, brainstorming session, uh, like um, arriving in IT, uh, some funny picture related to IT, and uh, interview backstage. So it was a little website, and we start to to have an audience from that, and to make connection with local journalists from with some NGO, and also so a good way to to prom to start to promote the project. Then when the release appear. 
uh, we did a press release uh, on our own, and uh, we sent that uh, and a special email emailing to the NGO, to the partner, to the fixer who worked with us uh, in Haiti, and to all the local uh, people uh, we photographed or we met, and uh, also all the people who could be interested in terms of development, and also on of uh, all the people who are working in journalism and innovation in journalism. And we do also a lot of uh, social network communication, and uh, we get featured in some press review. So this is a sample of uh, Facebook post, and to say, uh, hey, check it out. So then, for, for a project like this, and uh, there is always a second life, and uh, so the first week it's the buzz, and everyone is going to see your project. And uh, the second life, there is a different way for us to um, to act on it. Uh, first, as a photographer, usually when I do a picture, I think one picture can be sell again and again and can be seen in different uh, purpose, different context. So I try always, like, okay, I have done one project, but with that picture, I can I can do more. I can publish in different magazines. So, for instance, the picture made for the project uh, was were used in the in La Croix in uh, some newspaper uh, for article about Haiti. And um, we do also we we get we got some press article about the project, and uh, we are we had to follow the comments and social media animation. That means a lot of people ask us question about how we did the project. Uh, I write I wrote on my blog um, a topic, um, a post uh, to to explain what I did with the project. And uh, we enter to a few contests also to promote the project and to have a bigger impact uh, than only the website, the French website. And we did conferences uh, like, like today and we did uh, several conferences uh, before as well. So this is this is sample example of what we got. What, what is interesting, for, for example, for La Croix is that a project also, especially online, can, um, when you have the, the news um, for instance, in Haiti, in uh, this uh, January, it was the um, birthday of the fifth, fifth birthday of the earthquake. So people are getting back to the to Haiti and uh, getting interested in it. So the newspaper publish a story about Haiti, and uh, they make a link to our project and so on. So your project uh, depends on what's the new, uh, world news could uh, go again on the top of the scene, in front of the scene. So this is sample as well. This is, for example, what we did a table to see we have to enter to that contest or that contest. So we won two contests, and it's really good because it came out like the first one, the Online Journalism Awards. It was three months. It's an ugly picture. It was three months after the project. So uh, and we reach larger audience, especially in the U.S. with um, with that award because it's uh, it's delivered in uh, Chicago. And uh, then um, a few de few months after, in December, I won. We won a project, um, Agence Française de Développement Award for our project, and also it made us possible to reach more people, and uh, especially in the photojournalism community, because it was an award focused on the photojournalism uh, community. So little s the little stat I have. And uh, I just got uh, two days ago because I asked the website, and it's very difficult. It was said to get the data from the website you publish, where you publish the project, because they they keep it and they don't have uh, any data. So they just told us you have 20,000 visitors who came, uh, unique visitor in the French version of the project, and uh, 16,000 were the first week. And uh, yesterday, I tried to find how many tweets were uh, about the project. So I found the tool on the internet, and it was around 2,000 tweets. What is interesting is that, uh, especially in the online project, uh, you have tweet all all year long. And it's not only when, uh, for f of course, you have a lot of tweet at the beginning, but you have tweet in yeah, for a while. And uh, so this is a very recent tweet about our project. So that means people. Um, go into the project maybe later and uh, they don't focus only on the publication date. I'm al almost done. So the positive aspect me for me, I say it's that uh, to make a project in English that's that's good because you can reach globally an audience and you can share it with a lot of people and in France usually we share only in French. 
and uh, that's really good. And uh, I see that um, now Le Monde or Paris Match, for instance, for the last big international story, they publish an English version on their website, which is something totally new for them. And also it's accessible permanently, so sometimes maybe a student will have to do something on Haiti and we need, need uh, some, um, some information and we'll go to the project because it's still on the internet. And the limitation we had is that uh, mostly the people were interested in the concept rather than the subject. And uh, most of the article we had also were about the innovation, the news game as aspect, the storytelling, and, uh, and more than uh, what's going on in IT. So it's uh, maybe an issue, and, and it's maybe because I'm a journalist, so I'm in journalism community. But uh, I think in the next few years, when people will get used to that kind of uh, shape, format, uh, they will forget uh, what it is and it will become transparent so they will focus on the, um, on the subject. And uh, also multimedia was not accessible in country like IT. We send it to some journalists who helped us in, uh, in IT and uh, for some of them it was uh, not possible to view because the internet is bad. So with that kind of projects also you can't uh, touch any, anyone because uh, there is people who were not good access to internet. And also we didn't have uh, someone uh, in the project to follow up the second life and to, to, m to make data and s something and because we have to go to next project because we are freelancer. And, uh, and there is no call to action which is uh, last month I did a story in Mauritania and uh, for a French magazine and at the end it was eight pages. At the end it was, um, there is an NGO who made um, a text and to say if you like um, what's, what's happened in Haiti or if you want to, uh, in Mauritania, if you want to help this country, you can donate there. So it's kind of uh, the journal, the journal, the newspaper try to make the action possible and give the people the way to, to do it. So voilà, that's it. Thanks. So, well, first of all, I want to do a small experiment about impact. So here we have Periscope. So I'm asking someone, volunteers, to film the session and see what's the impact on Periscope. So does anyone just want to take a five minutes film for me? Okay. Let's start broadcasting. Yep. No, you have to, yeah. It's, yeah, good. <laughs> I apologize for using you. Well, uh, thank you everybody. Uh, I'm here to present um, two projects that I've done with AJC. Um, so in 2013, we won uh, the first AJC award and with a project which the main goal was understanding how Italian public funds are used in cooperation and development. Uh, so the idea was like doing a basic, you know, uh, maps to showcase this data to see where and how this money has pended. And so, yeah, you can have a lot of details. You can see internet connection is low, but you can see oh, we have some data about the place and how funds have changed through the years. It was a good tool. Uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, good positive feedbacks, but interestingly, uh, almost uh, a year after we started developing this, the Minister of Foreign Affairs launched this very great open data website that it's quite similar to us because the, the person who did our uh, system also contributed to this one. So, uh, the, the year after we, uh, no, actually, sorry. I, and together with this um, data visualization system, we also created the four stories about project in, uh, funded by Italian public funds. And the idea was like having, story, having a series of stories in order to keep the story in the newspaper. So every two weeks, we publish one story. So every time people can just click and, you know, go to the data visualization system, but also have, you know, information about how money are used, where, what are the people actually benefiting this, from this public money, that our taxpayers' money. And then the next year, we, 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 we were thinking about, well, what can, what, what can we do next? What's the next step? So 
the previous year we, we have seen how we spend money, but then we asked how people would like to see their money spent. And so we decided to do a small game where people basically have the, um, the, the Italian national budget for cooperation and development. And then can, they have this huge stack of money and they can decide in which sector they can allocate the money. And for each sector, for example, you have a small explanation just you know, to have ideas about um, some data about where you're actually putting money you know, to educate a little bit yourself in case you're not really aware of. So once you allocate this money, it takes a while, sorry. But I mean, you have to make a decision. I mean, it's not just you throw all the money in one place, right? I mean, we, est we estimate like the, um, to complete the whole game like around about five minutes. And then we say, well, five minutes is a lot of time, especially if you have to drag and drop these things, which is okay, I mean, you can do it. But then you will see in the next section, you still have to work. So uh, it was important here also to have people engaged to create shortcuts in order to, you know, if you don't have much time, well, you have selected which sector you want to put the money in. So you have basically two options. You can just go to results or otherwise decide in which country you want to allocate money. So just an idea is then you, for each sector, you can decide which country. All these countries are the priority countries for the Italian Minister of Foreign Affairs. And, uh, well, it was, it was an, uh, the, 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 the game was well received. We had uh, at least 10,000 people completing it. And uh, the whole idea was not just to collect the results because, I, sorry, let me go back so I can show you results. So, yeah. I'm sure. I say yes. Okay, internet's quite slow. Well, anyway, the, the, the whole idea was once you get the, all the results from, from the people from um, that have taken this, this game, uh, was to create a report that we actually just, we are finalizing it and bring it to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Because the idea was, well, the, the citizens, the readers have this opinion on how to spend money, we now wanna hear from the minister what's their perception, with their opinion on what the Italian thinks. Uh, of course, it's not statistically significant, I mean, because we didn't select a, a, a demographic cluster, so it's not something that it's fully representative of what Italians do. But still, like, you have engaged readers from major Italian newspaper that express their ideas on how to spend money, and so the minister will have to react on this and explain why, what, what do they think, basically, if they will take into account these ideas on what they will do in the next years to come. Oh, here's the result. Sorry, that's not our fault, that's the internet. <laughs> so, yeah, basically, here you have a result, you, you see in which sector you're using your money, you have a small badge you can share on social networks because that's for us quite relevant. Uh, and so, yeah, that, that was the, the main idea of the whole game. And, and of course, I mean, the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs has been very interesting from both of the projects because, for example, for the, for the first one, they realized that their, their data system, what is lacking is actually stories. Because in our project, we have the data, but also we have the stories. We have the people, we have the uh, storytelling, we have the pictures, the video, and everything. And so they decided to add that to the system and ask us to contribute with stories and ask us to if we can share all the picture documents we have done with the previous project and with the second follow the money to give for free to them, which we agreed, of course, because it's to promote a good project done by NGOs and by international, uh, by, by professional in the, in, the, in the cooperation field. And, uh, and also, I mean, the, 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 the thing that the minister also wanna bring the game into a program they have with schools. So they will have the kids playing the game, you know, to teach them what is uh, cooperation and development, what is budget for cooperation and development, what is the philosophy behind decision when you allocate money to, to cooperation and development. In terms of numbers, I, I think we didn't really get huge numbers because, well, it's not cooperation and development. I mean, to be, a, we, we are honest, is not like on the top list of readings for the Italian public. People are engaged, people are interested, but 
probably if we would have done a game on the budget for finance or defense, probably would be more participated. But at least we, we increase the, the attention of people. We have seen also in the La Stampa, uh, the La Stampa has increased the number of readers throughout the, 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 the year, or the people engaging with, the, with, the, with, the, with our stories. The first year we had a decent amount, but the second year we have seen an increase. Also the director put the stories on the homepage, so they you know, put more attention on the whole project. Uh, I think I, I'm done, I don't wanna like, take too much time, I'm open then for discussion, but I just wanna uh, close with a, with a, with a thought. Uh, the fact that when we measure impact, we also have to see not only the quantity, but also the quality of the impact we had. And I think something we have tried to achieve with this project is like having also quality impact. So having like uh, relevant people in NGOs that came back to us and have people from government that came back to us and you know, like, like with Isabetta, it's interesting having like researcher, uh, professionals that you know engage with your project. I think it's important to to, to keep the project alive after uh, even after it has been published, like now we're doing with Periscope. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Emanuele. And uh, before we start the discussion, uh, I would like to give the word to Stein, uh, who told me before the event that he has uh, quite a strong opinion about impact measurement. So I'd like him to share that with us. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I think there's, there's so many different facets to impact measurement. And I think a lot of what you've seen here is sort of, you know, very uh, targeted projects where, you know, we saw or the journalists doing the project saw a problem and you know, they figured you know, we need to write something about this. Uh, I guess sort of from my perspective, uh, I'm really interested in that, but I'm also really interested in sort of journalism in general, sort of you know, the other 90% or the other 95% of what gets published. Um, and I think the, the problems there are, are somewhat different, right, because you, you have, for example, um, sorry, I'm collecting my, thought, my thoughts here. You have sort of the, the big problem that you see is what Jonathan Stray calls the last mile problem, which is that we write about so many different things and then we expect uh, democracy will happen or you know, uh, a solution will, will sort of come forward or you know, in some cases, a politician will get fired or a new law will come into action. But it's never quite clear how exactly that happens. And so that's why, why Jonathan Stray calls it the last mile problem. It comes from telecommunications. So you have, you know, the internet goes through these fat cables that get it to sort of close to your house. But then it still has to travel that last mile to your specific apartment and your specific house. And that's usually for telecommunications, it's the really hard part because they have to sort of lay all these cables in residential areas. It's really annoying. Um, and it's really annoying for journalism as well because we have sort of a general idea of how we can have an impact with journalism. But then when you ask people sort of a specific question about, well, so your project, how, how will it change things, what kind of impact do you think it will have? Uh, that is usually a much harder question to answer. Um, and, and I think, you know, sort of the, the big uh, sort of way people describe that is that journalism doesn't always have a theory of change. Now, the, the other problem there is, of course, that maybe we don't want journalism to have a theory of change. I think a lot of journalists uh, are really interested in the idea of, or, or really invested in the idea that what they do is, uh, you know, they just present the truth. They try to present the truth anyway. They try to be objective about things. And, uh, and so asking them to sort of start thinking about, well, how do how does my project or how does my writing, how does that impact uh, our readership? Is it gonna get anything done? Is sort of 
uh, sacrilegious in a way, right? Because you're asking journalists to, su to suddenly take a, a, a stance in some way. Like even if, they're, if they think they're being objective, you're asking them to sort of, you know, put forward a, a vision of how their, uh, uh, their stories could, could make a, a change. And it's really hard for people to accept. It gets into the whole question of, um, which I hope some, some of you here are familiar with, the question of solution, solutions journalism, which is sort of a movement that, that uh, uh, certain journalists subscribe to around sort of before you do a story, ask yourself like, okay, so for example, it, I think a, a big example has been when uh, ProPublica, for example, uh, did stories about um, how the quality of care in certain um, uh, care facilities for the elderly were really not up to scratch. I think this was probably in the US because that's where ProPublica is from. Um, but so from the very start when they did that project, what they wanted to figure out is, well, how can we get in touch with uh, family members of the elderly so they know what's going on so we can actually sort of reach the people that should know this information because you know usually when you write about something you don't know who is going to read this or the right people going to read this um, so they really focused on that they also really focused on you know well what are some of the changes that could happen uh, you know if, if the elderly are not being properly cared for what does it look like to care for them properly what properly what would have to change so that when people read their stories, first off, it's going to be the right people reading it, and secondly, they will know what they can do about it because you're actually telling them, like, this is what you can do about it. Um, and so there's a lot, lot, lots of journalists who are really interested in, in that concept of solutions journalism. There's also lots of journalists who are really scared of it because they don't feel that, that it's their position. I, I don't personally really have an answer to that. It's just sort of, you, you know, it depends on sort of your attitude towards, uh, towards journalism. Um, I guess the other problem is, especially when you look at, uh, when measuring impact, uh, is that a lot of impact happens over really long periods of time. Uh, sort of a good example is environmental journalism where I think for the last 10, 15, 20 years uh, uh, as a group journalists have done a really good job in bringing forward um, sort of stories about environmental disasters, about the troubles uh, with, uh, with global warming. Uh, you know, it's, I think 20 years ago we called it the greenhouse effect. Um, but um, I think we've done a really good job with that, but you can't really point at any individual story and say like, this is the story that changed everything. No, that just doesn't happen. It needs sort of a concerted effort over a long period of time, and that is what provides the impact. But of course, when we have these uh, sort of organizations that are interested in funding our work, well, that's not really what they care about. They care about the impact that your individual story can have. And so that, you know, sometimes puts, uh, puts us in a difficult position because it does get uh, much harder uh, to measure. Um, I think sort of one last remark that I want to make is when it comes to the measurement of impact, what you see in, uh, in academia, there's a, c a couple of projects currently being funded um, uh, the Media Impact Project at the Lear Center at uh, the University of Sa Southern California, if I'm correct, um, is, is a big one, and, and you should look it up. They're, they're doing some interesting stuff. But if you look at that literature, what they're trying to do is they're trying to sort of figure out sort of more advanced ways of measuring impact and sort of trying to come up with all of the uh, problems around measuring impact. Uh, and I, I do hope that you, you don't sort of walk away from this session or that you walk away from, uh, from reading some of that academic material, if you're interested in that, because it is quite interesting, that you, I wouldn't want you to walk away from that with the idea that measuring impact is, is impossible or is really hard. Uh, I think there's lots of potential problems with measuring impact through Fa um, through your Facebook likes for a story or through your page views or through 
uh, engagement on social media. That's all, you know, there's all ways in which that could not really reflect impact. But I think it does provide sort of a general uh, sort of overview of sort of, well, I guess what, uh, what, I guess what it provides is the conditions for uh, impact. So if, if your article uh, that you wrote got zero page views, then what is the potential impact of that article? Well, it's zero. Now, if your article got 100 page views, then it might still have gotten a huge impact if it got read by 100 really interesting people in really high places. But the probability is quite low. Now, if you have one million people reading your article, then what you've done is you've not ensured impact. You can't really know that for sure until, you know, until a little bit later on. But you've ensured the conditions for impact. You've, you know, as some people like to call it, you've increased your luck surface area. You know, for every page view, you have uh, an increment of, of luck uh, that uh, you can spend and, and that uh, increases your chances of getting seen by the right people in, in the right places. And uh, yeah, so I guess that's just sort of my general message is, you know, our, the ways in which we measure impact are not perfect at all, uh, but, uh, but they are worth uh, measuring. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to, to come back to uh, uh, Stefano and to Pierre um, because um, uh, you did not uh, mention in your presentation so much, uh, did you notice any uh, impact on policy making, for instance, uh, from uh, your work? Uh, did uh, NGOs, did uh, governments, did international organizations pick it up? Did they learn something from it? I mean, uh, you did very exciting, very deep investigations on location and you know you you uh, find out the networks that were behind them and so on and so forth but uh, is and I'm not saying this is uh, insufficient but is there anything that you became aware of where for instance the European Commission uh, picked up on your uh, investigation into the um, uh, the, the uh, uh, into their subsidies for instance um, will they perhaps think about changing them or was there anything uh, about Haiti uh, in terms of uh, uh, redirecting international aid or um, reconfiguring the way France uh, is looking at uh, this kind of international health programs, for instance? You know, that, that was actually our goal from the beginning to, it's, it's in general our goal as journalists to make things change. So to be the watchdog and also to make, uh, to raise awareness uh, both to public opinion or to decision makers. Uh, as for the specific project, we, I, I myself, I presented this project at the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Italy and uh, with uh, s some stakeholders. But then I must confess there was no big follow up and also it's part of our fault, because as uh, Wilfred was pointed out, when you, okay, you do your story, it's been published like everywhere, I mean very well published, then there were some reviews, and then you just turn the page and go to some other stories, and, and that's a pity, eh? I, I, uh, I'm aware of that. And, but I think also that uh, to get more impact, we know we, we should have a, a communication strategy uh, after publication, afterwards, and also before it. So that was not uh, done, and that was something we learned from this project. And I, I, I'm saying, I mean, we made some boot camp uh, with uh, the EGC, and I think communication strategy is really important. And uh, I, um, I praise FIFA to organize some training, because we're not trained to do that. We are journalists, so we know how to investigate, we go to the field, to put together a story in some different ways. But then uh, we're not, I mean, I myself, I'm not that strong in... Uh, uh, putting together a communication strategy, and I would like to learn it. 
and that it's important for this for those kind of projects because I mean we worked like six months on that then uh, we have like two three months to follow up and then just say okay it's uh, I'm here presenting it but now I'm working on other projects you know so that is so that's uh, that's basically the first thing on impact then I think uh, uh, if I can make a very very sh uh, quick remark we um, we we wanted to have impact on decision makers, but there is also another uh, angle. So that this was really uh, personally and professionally important for us. And then we went to when we went to Southern Italy fields, talking to the people, and then they were m very much focused on uh, on their lack of documents. They were their main problem. And then when we told them, but you know that your tomato are going to your country, and they were like. Uh, Amazed, and so you we, we made kind of ra we kind of raise awareness among them, and so I think the journalist is as these two um, two it could work as a bridge. So you go to get information on the field, but also you can provide information to people, and so raise awareness to the people who are involved in your story and in your uh, project. Then to make things change is far more difficult, but should uh, we should have this goal all the time. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, maybe just one uh, remark on your Italian tomato story. I know. Um, if I put it in my Google search, I look, search for Italian tomatoes, your story is on page one. So the dark side of the tomatoes made it to the Italian tomato main page which I think is some measure of success. <laughs> so, so to reply to your um, question, um, I think we, we didn't do so much an inv investigation project. It was more a um, reportage project. And uh, the main problem issue we see and we saw in IT, it was a p an issue of uh, image of and uh, self-esteem. I don't know if it's the correct word in English, but how people can think they they can grow and they can uh, be a rich country. And uh, when we, IT has always been covered in the bad way of earthquake, manifestation, demonstration, and uh, terrible way. And when, when we went there, our focus was to, f to promote the positive aspect of IT and to see what, what that works. And uh, so in that way, I think, you can also change stuff when you change the image of the country, when you change the image of, of something, and when also you, div you give a perspective to the people, and, and people can, in IT, in the project, we saw a tablet uh, company uh, made in Haiti, for example, and, and it's something when you show that to people, they think differently about Haiti. And it's the same, I guess, for all the story about Africa, because we have we have to change our mind about Africa, and then that will the change of image will ch will make concrete change on the ground. And um, then, to be really concrete to your question, we just got to contact with the French Embassy and French Institute in Haiti. They they saw our project and they told us that's really good, one of the best considering Haiti. And then we don't know, we don't have the resource to follow what's going on, but. I guess what we do is to yeah to give materials and to give different uh, view to the people who are uh, acting and then they do what they can or what they want and um, we'll see. But it's a long time. But it's more yeah for us it's more about image what what you can do, especially in country where it was really bad. Okay, thank you very much. I just learned we need to wrap up. Uh, I thought we had 90 minutes, but we don't, apparently. Um, so um, I think concluding, uh, the conclusion is that indeed uh, intelligent journalism can include impact uh, from the very start and perhaps also develop impact over time. Uh, thank you very much to the panel and uh, uh, have a nice time in Perugia. Thank you. <laughs>